up bros, it's about that time I take you through the gear I carry with me on my travels. So if you'd perhaps like to go make yourself a cup of tea, I'll show you the fundamental items that tend to remain a constant regardless of the duration of the journey. Whether it be an overnighter, a three day outing or a five day outing, these are the items that form the core of my outdoor kit. Three categories, water, fire and first aid. Let's start with water, but rather than me just pointing to things and describing them, I'll show you a day in the life. It's story time. Step one, find a running water source. Fill that bad boy stainless steel water bottle right up. Construct my fire lay. Light that fire. Build that fire. Enjoy that fire. Revel in this fleeting feeling of masculinity while it reduces to embers. Insert four ordinary stainless steel tent pegs vertically amongst the fire and embers. Then place some 15 by 15 centimeter stainless steel wire mesh on top of it. This serves as my grill to cook food upon, but also serves to keep my cookware up and away from the fire to prevent the metal from blackening with soot and char, as that's a nightmare to scrub off. And less time spent cleaning cookware equals more time to pensively reflect and ponder existence. Then whack that cup on top. Both cups and water bottle have a ghetto rigged arrangement of brass wire underneath the lips that serves as a bail handle. And this is the point where I filter my water. I just wrap a cotton bandana around the nozzle and pour. Easy life saves me having to digest fragments of rock and sand. In this instance it did capture quite a fair amount of particulate. Add the lid so it boils faster. Remove the now boiled safe to drink water by picking it up underneath the ghetto brass wire bail handle. And the grill and tent pegs are easily removed too. That's job done. And if I'm heading off and want some purified water on hand, then I'll fill that bad boy bottle back up and then just completely nest the bottle and engulf it in flames. As to ensure that the threads and lip of the bottle are completely sterilised. That's a lesson I learned the hard way. And all the cookware nests nicely together. I carry a few other water related paraphernalia in my kit. Chlorine dioxide water purification tablets for those times where mother nature makes life hard and fire isn't sustainable. Or for those occasions where I just cannot be bothered to make a fire. Cookware gets pretty filthy over extended periods of time, so my cotton bandana also serves as a cleaning rag. As a consequence, the rag gets pretty filthy, so I scrub that cloth in a river and wrap it around the back of my neck to let my body heat dry it out throughout the day. And a cheeky little fourth nesting container, a char tin. A now unrecognisable air rifle pellet tin, turned into tactical tinder procurement apparatus after stabbing a hole in it with a screwdriver. So if I fancy recycling a piece of cotton clothing, just whack that in, throw it in the fire, a few minutes later, char cloth, the most foolproof, easy to use tinder out there. Grab a piece of steel and a piece of flint, rest the char cloth on top of the flint, whack that flint, make them sparks, get one of those sparks to hit the char cloth and you've got yourself an ember. Combine that ember with tinder of the gods, otherwise known as red cedar bark, bellow that ember, lose yourself in a cloud of smoke, until it can bust into flames. Easy game, easy life. Bit of char cloth goes a long way and that's a nice segue into the fire kit. This is significantly more substantial than my typical fire kit but I've extended it in this video to cover all the various fire related equipment I've used and featured over the past year as some inquiries were raised. Loyal subscribers are probably sick to death of seeing this. The pencil sharpener but I've upped the game, got myself a larger one so I can shave larger sticks for the easy peasy procurement of wood shavings to use as tinder. A lazy man's way of making feather sticks. And with a few sparks from a ferrocerium rod, we have fire. It really is that easy. This is my crack pipe, also known as a fire piston. A gimmicky way of making fire, but a very fun way of making fire doesn't always work though. Sometimes it's the best of times, 
sometimes it's the worst of times. It's very Charles Dickens. Two components, piston and cylinder. It works by rapidly compressing air in an airtight chamber, which in turn creates a significant amount of pressure within the chamber, which in turn increases the temperature within the chamber often to the point where the internal temperature of the chamber reaches that of the combustion temperature of the tinder you've placed in the piston. Like a miniature diesel engine. Nifty. This particular piston is known as the Wilderness Solutions Amber Fire Piston. Pretty high end, retail price is about $60, but I snapped this up second hand off eBay for $15. Absolute bargain. Very David Dickinson. A ferrocerium rod. The BEX fire steel in particular. Doesn't require much explanation. It's long. It throws fantastic showers of sparks. Gives you the capabilities of absolutely drowning tinders in sparks rather than lightly showering them in sparks. The striker it comes with is garbage. So I just use the back of my knife as a striker. For full 100% overkill man mode. Flint and steel. For those times where a ferrocerium rod would work perfectly fine, but you want to make life intentionally more difficult for yourself for the sake of on-camera showmanship. An arrangement of high carbon steel that takes on the shape of a gnome's knuckle duster. Slip your fingers through and strike off fine shavings of the metal by grazing it against a sharp edged rock such as flint or quartz. And those shavings will oxidise in the air. Sparks. Easy. A few sticks of fat wood. Conifer wood impregnated with flammable natural resins. It's nature's equivalent of wood soaked in gasoline. It will burn from even the dimmest of sparks providing that it's processed fine enough. And once it ignites it will burn independently as it contains its own fuel source. A block of this size will burn for about 5 minutes straight. So it's a good compensator for working with very little kindling and good fuel for a fire that otherwise might struggle in the early stages due to damp, humidity or rain. And as a bonus, it smells absolutely beautiful. It is an orgasm for your sense of smell. You will be reluctant to throw this in a fire. You'll just want to sit there all day sniffing it. Or maybe that's just me, maybe I'm just a bit weird. This is my stash of crystal meth, otherwise known as pine resin. The resinous hydrocarbon excretions from coniferous trees. Host to a multitude of flammable compounds, very much so identical to fatwood in terms of how easy it is to ignite and the length of time in which it burns independently. A small stash of tinder fungus which comes from this majestic fungi, the horse's hoof fungi. Dense, firm, but soft and ignitable. It's composed of thousands upon thousands of tiny little fluffy fibers that make it so easy to turn into an ember. It smolders for an incredibly long period of time, size depending. A block of this size could smolder for 20 minutes, so it's a transportable ember. Handy, especially when combined with a magnifying glass where you often have to head out of the tree line to get some direct sunlight. This particular magnifying glass is just an ordinary reading magnifying glass that my grandmother donated to the cause. And because it's so large and so thick, it captures a lot of light, so its use can be extended into autumn and spring rather than just summer. It's gimmicky, but it's fun, which is what I value. And finally, wind, water and stormproof matches for those times where I just legitimately cannot be bothered with the aforementioned procedures. And also for those times where Mother Nature is making life really hard with dampness and humidity. I cheat occasionally when the camera's not rolling. Too many ways of making fire one may say, but I like the variety. Because my life is so dull and uneventful, this is the only spice I have in my life. But this is what I typically carry. A pencil sharpener, ferrocerium rod and matches. And those items fit nicely into the velcro compartment of my knife sheath of which belongs to the Becker BK7. Oh my God, what a sexy knife, right? But sparing extensive knife talk, due to its size and weight, I consider it a jack of all trades, a good middle ground between carrying both an ax and a knife. 
I feel it possesses the same functionality and effective performance as both of those individual items, in my opinion. Let's not fight about that, because it's a touchy subject. This knife has had so much work done to it, courtesy of Doberman knives, the pimper of knives, the Jesus Christ of bladesmithing, sculpts metal like Michelangelo sculpts marble, so much work that it should not be considered a BK7 anymore. So from this point on, I'm happy to refer to this as the Doberman 6.5. But if this tickles your fancy and you're interested in viewing a review and demonstration of this knife, I've got a video dedicated to that. Otherwise, we'll move on from the Doberman 6.5. On to the boring part, the first aid kit. We'll blow through this quick because you already know the deal. An assortment of band-aids. Several crepe bandages, cut down to a more practical size. Skin closure steri strips for those times where you need to close a wound. Last time I had an open wound, I had no steri strips, so I had to use duct tape, which is fine, it worked well, the wound closed, but then came the inevitable moment where I had to rip out half of my leg hair to change the dressing. Very bad times. Antiseptic wipes. These are items I use incredibly frequently, primarily used for medicinal purposes, but sometimes, you know, it's just nice to clean your hands every now and then. Maintain a basic standard of hygiene. A different medium of disinfection, antiseptic liquid, TCP antiseptic liquid to be precise because sometimes wipes just don't cut it. Also has a little dabber for precise and efficient application. Or if it's just a really deep puncture from a massive thorn, just ram that bad boy in there and prevent that tetanus. The little vials are sample bottles of perfume from Avon. UK bros will be familiar. And a larger bottle of TCP for diluting in water and using it as a mouthwash, but also to combat throat infections, sore throats, all manner of oral ailments. Or just straight up drowning a wound in panic, which is the most common use. Needle and thread, because clothes rip, sometimes, or your buddy accidentally kneels down on a red hot ember and burns a hole in his trousers. Fix that up, right as rain, carry on with the chores of the outdoors. A course of broad spectrum antibiotics. Oxytetracycline. If something out here is gonna kill me, it will not be infection or sepsis. Got that well covered. A hefty load of duct tape, about 20 meters of it. Patches, holes in shelters, tarps, it's binding, it's cordage. Flammable, it can be used as kindling, super strong waterproof plasters, steri strips to a certain extent, blister prevention pads, splinter, puller router. I've got practical applications for days. Signal mirror, although it's never used for signaling, it's used for the routine face check for cuts, beard check for debris, neck and back check for ticks, tweezers for tactical tick and splinter removal. A plastic sandwich bag and water purification tablet. It serves as a backup emergency water bladder. Fill the bag up with water, drop a bad boy water purification tablet in there. Easy game, easy life. Safe, drinkable water. At the cost of everything tasting like chlorine and plastic chemicals, but you know, you learn to deal with a third nipple you grow as a consequence. And of course, the compass and spare. Where would I be without them? Is that a pun? It's a bit of a pun, we'll roll with it. Let me have that one. And that concludes the gear I carry. All of the cased gear tucks away nice and neatly into the hydration bladder housing of my bag. Cookware and knife, nice and snug up front, which leaves a lot of room for food and clothing and various other frivolous luxuries, all in a modestly sized backpack. I have intentionally neglected to mention any form of shelter because they all attach externally and I've had the same shelter system for about three years now so nothing has changed since the last kit review. It would be incredibly redundant to talk about it all again. But anyway, that's that my friends. Thanks for watching. Peace!